Sounds good. All you right. want to introduce the project? We can go around for a round of who's who. Are you at the Zoom folks again? Yeah. Are in here? Yep, we got we've got um it's like uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. <clears throat> I see six people plus Orca and Damon. Okay. Yeah, do we want to um, do introductions first? Or do want... Yeah, so let's, let's, in, let's introduce the project and yep. go around and introductions. Who's taking time to attend, and we'll go from there. Do you want to start off with any? Uh... Sure. Um, uh, my name is Tom Badowski. I'm with the town of Berlin. This is the uh, of, of Vermont Department of Transportation funded Fisher Road uh, scoping study. And I just want to thank everybody for attending. This is our second, really, our public uh, meeting. Um, this project will be winding down soon. I think we have a March or April uh, time frame for, for completion. So hope you could stay connected and would appreciate your thoughts. Hey, Tom. Um, so I'm Chris Sargent. I'm here in the, um, the uh, moderator's seat um, for this. I'm the project manager for this project. I work with the Boys and King. And I'm joined by uh, David Kreitzer. No, I just love to share. Uh, well, we'll see how it goes. Anyway, Dayton Kreitz here is with me. Uh, you'll hear from him in a second uh, from the Boys and King. Um, I'm Bob Warnick. I'm with the VRB. I'm Signine Goddard. I live on Hill Street Extension in Berlin. I'm Becky Goddard with the same place. Her mom. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Goddard, also related. I see that you guys came together. Yeah. Um, so folks on Zoom, I'm going to call on you, and if you'd be willing to unmute and just uh, introduce yourself, that'd be great. Uh, Becky? Hi, I'm Becky Thompson. I live on um, Stuart Road. Thanks. Uh, Michael? Uh, Mike Rush, <clears throat> pardon me, Mike Rush, been a consultant working with the owners of the Berlin Mall. Eileen? Awesome. Uh, Eileen He, I work at CVMC. Uh, Theron? Hi, folks. I'm Theron Laysleeper. I'm a resident of West Berlin, and I'm on the planning commission with Tom as well. Awesome. And uh, Jim? Hi, Jim Alvarez from Central Vermont Medical Center. Awesome. And that is everybody. I'm assuming we're not going to have the introductions from Orkin either. Plus, we have a new person. Here, so thank you, everybody. Um, all right, let's get, let's get rolling. Here. Start it off, and then I'm going to hand off to Dayton. Yep. Um, so let's just talk about what we're doing here tonight. We're talking about what's uh, we're talking about a scoping study um, that is intended to look at how to make Fisher Road be more of a gateway for the new town center. So really in the progression of things, we have this new town center application. Um, the town went through a great process to sort of say, listen, we don't have a village. We, we would like to, or we don't have a village center. We would really like a village center. What, what can we do to make that? And ultimately they settled on, on a, a really interesting project and we'll kind of second uh, to build out the Berlin Mall area and make it more of a village center. One of the impacts of that is going to be just more development, more traffic um, and so our job is to accommodate, figure out how to accommodate more cars and at the same time also make the road something that is uh, maybe a more inviting um, uh, gateway into this new town center. So this is for, I don't know if folks have seen it, this is the a, a, um, conceptual design of the new town center uh, with all sorts of potentially new uh, development that's going to be here over time. Um, fascinating. It's really interesting for me as a planner in Vermont to see communities do this because, you know, most towns, have it. we're not creating a village from scratch. So it's really interesting to see this. And now I'm going to toss it over to Dave because he's going to talk about the serious stuff and how all of what I just told you relates to the road. Yeah, and just to just to orient for anyone that's not familiar with this plan, the Fisher Road's on the right hand side here, um, and you can see in gray existing buildings. So CBMC is on the lower right, the big medical campus there. You've got Berlin Mall is the, the and the Walmart is the most prominent buildings, um, you know, left in this image of uh, Fisher Road, and then it's all these buildings in red that are you know would be the new development to create a walkable multimodal center with shared use pathways connecting places, walkable streets. And the real question is, and part of the Newtown Center plan did include sort of some, some big ideas about 
how we connect, would it be a sky bridge connecting across Fisher Road? Like, how do we really bridge this gap? Because you've got a major employer in CVMC, you've got a major employer in the mall, Walmart, and everything around there. You've got existing senior housing now, and the new town center as it builds out will have even more housing um, in it. And the real question is, we have all these great uses coming together, just like really, really idealized in Vermont um, about these compact walkable centers. So how do we make that happen? Because anybody that knows Fisher Road today knows that there's something left to be desired as a place to walk and spend time on the street, right? It's a it's a auto-oriented road. So that's a lot of what our scoping study is looking at is how do we make this auto-oriented road something that could be better and be fitting of a future town center where you have so many um, great uses coming together. And so, you know, the main concerns outside of that, it's not a lovely place to walk, is, you know, we've, we've highlighted many of them them on the screen and you know starting from the bottom up there's really one little piece of sidewalk along the corridor and that's in front of the Vermont, Vermont Psychiatric uh, Hospital um, really all along the road you really have parking lots coming right up to it and so there's even outside the road there's not a lot of really pedestrian oriented spaces um, and then as you get into the main intersection between CBMC and Berlin Mall Road it widens out to three lanes in either direction, and it's um, quite a lot of asphalt there, creating long crossing distances that aren't safe at the one pedestrian crossing that does exist. Um, and you know, then when you get all the way to Route 62 on foot, that's the place that really you know, not supposed to be walking, you're not supposed to be biking on Route 62. But what about crossing Fisher Road to Airport Road, right? So that's all these things that we're we're looking at and saying, how could um, future plans for this roadway address this? As we get into it, I just want to kind of mention a couple of key design considerations that this might be a little bit wonky, but when we're when we're thinking about road design, these things are important. Um, a really unique thing is that this has a tapering <laughs> tapering road, it says on the screen. Um, that doesn't mean much to people that don't work in traffic daily, but that's right of way. And that's basically where there is public domain in the roadway for making changes. Um, and then there, on the other side of that invisible line is private land. And whenever you're doing street designs, you're designing within that right of way. And so what's really interesting is as you approach basically from the uh, uh, Berlin Mall Road, CVMC intersection to Route 62, it's about 100 feet wide. It's a very wide right of way through there. Um, as you go, as you go sort of northwest of that and get over towards Payne Turnpike, it has a tapering section. And then it's a 50 foot right of way um, as you approach Payne Turnpike. So very different road profiles that, that we have to accommodate. Um, and that's actually one of the reasons too that you see these lanes really get wider as you get to Route 62 because there's just more more right of way there. Um, related somewhat is my my joking label of mullet access. Um, it's a party for cars off of Route 62. There's a lot of use, a lot of heavy traffic there, and it's a lot quieter um, on Payne Turnpike in terms of traffic loads, in terms of you know what how safe it is to be out there as a bicycle pedestrian, in terms of crash records. So there's sort of this two-sidedness to, to Fisher Road that we're, we're considering in these designs. One, one thing I should mention too is, is that we are, as part of the scoping study, we are not looking at making changes to the Route 62 intersection. It's not part of this particular project. You know, we may have some suggestions as part of this project of things that Lutheran should do, but because that's a state-owned, that, that, that Route 62 is what's called a limited access highway, which means we really, only the state can do things on it. And they can all they can only fit only they can fiddle with it so it's not a significant focus we could argue that it needs some yeah. fixing but yeah the, this study will make recommendations and can and should probably make a lot of recommendations for how it can be improved but the actual design work really focuses on what is town controlled um on fisher road and so when we talk about these designs i'll jump into in just a minute you know these are these are sort of our goals that we want to really put together to make a good design for fisher road and the way these scoping studies work as well is I'm about to run through three different designs that could be applied to the roadway. And we don't have to just pick one and say, that's what the study said, we picked this one. We can pick pieces of them. And really that's where I appreciate everybody coming in on Zoom, people coming in person, because that's really where your input and, and your neighbor's input becomes important. And we got a survey to get there as well. But the goals we're trying to get to in all of this is, you know, I've talked a lot about making it a better place to walk and bike. But it's also knowing that we're building a new town center here and we need to manage traffic volumes. You know, we can't put an alternative forward that is an amazing place for people to walk and bike and is a traffic jam the whole time. That, that won't work. That's not what we want to do. Um, so we have to balance that. 
Um, we also need to really balance um, recognition that we live in Vermont and it is, we have a wide range of seasons and we need to be able to plow this and maintain it just as well as enjoy the shade of the trees in the summer. Um, and at the same time, I think what's really exciting about an opportunity like this, where you look at a road that is perhaps over wide in some places that has a hundred foot wide of way at one end, um, that has a future town center coming around it, is how can we find opportunities to create a sense of place and not just, and this is a roadway with parking lots on it, but, right? So those are our design goals we're trying to get to. So what do we think we could do? Well, one of them, here's the cheapest option, we could do nothing and just leave it there. All scoping studies that we look at that are funded by VTrans, I think importantly, have a no build option. And that's something that we're not gonna spend a whole lot of time discussing it because everyone knows it. Um, but it's it's in there just to say, sometimes communities say, you know what, the right thing is to leave it alone. Um, but then the three other options that we're looking at, um, two very closely related, but it's about their application. Um, a paint only road diet is how we would look at saying, what improvements could we do with paint alone and just really defining the spaces in the roadway differently and that would be extremely low cost it could be implemented you know likely on town budgets not trying to go for significant grants um, from the feds or anything else but it could test out really you see the relationship in this diet in this diagram between the dashed lines on paint only road diet and the next one down of lane reduction and sidewalks where the paint only road diet does sort of this this temporary paint-based application of the same design that we explore in lane reduction and sidewalks. And the big difference is when you're doing full construction of lane reduction, adding sidewalks, you're spending a lot more money to build these things permanently. Um, it'll have better effect and it will also last a lot longer and you get sidewalks out of that. And then the, the third option that we'll look at tonight is a roundabout and pathway. And so exploring a different design for an actual uh, intersection right there in the middle of Fisher Road at the CBMC and mall road intersection and instead of doing sidewalks on either side of the road saying look we want this to be a multimodal street we want the commuters that are coming from elsewhere in berlin coming from montpelier up to the mall or up to cbnc or the new town center to be able to bike there let's make a, a shared use pathway and i should actually also mention we'll see it in a minute but lane reduction and sidewalk also have bike lanes so I'll go through these categories um, as we to try to present the alternatives in sort of these four categories of, of reference. So we're gonna look at what improvements happen for bicycle and pedestrians on the street compared to today. We'll look at green space expansion and sort of what's, where can we have fine opportunities for rain gardens, street trees as part of this road diet and changes to the roadway. Um, we'll talk a bit about our intersection designs and what changes are proposed there. And we'll also talk about the impacts on traffic modeling. We've run this through um, some pretty advanced traffic modeling to look at what, based on what we anticipate being full build out of the new town center, um, what, what that could look like. And this is this is a little bit about our traffic modeling. Our engineer that ran this isn't with us tonight. Um, I will do my best to answer any questions I can on these. And I have a good sense of sort of the overall um, effect and impacts based on traffic modeling. But what this is, is it looks at the traffic volumes a couple years out, you know, just using basic increases to um, regional traffic load and knowing what's happening um, in the next couple of years at the town center. And then it also forecasts all the way out to 2045, assuming this town center is proposed as fully built and there's 300 plus new residential units. There's over 5,200 square feet of new commercial services. There's improved walkability here within the new town center. And it shows about the 17% growth in, in trips along Fisher Road based on that. Um, that's also because a lot of the trips generated in the new town center would also flow out away from Fisher Road is why that number sits there. So that's kind of what a lot of these numbers are based on. And if I can add to, uh, this also includes um, a certain level of, um, so we've done work with CDMC for other related projects and we do have uh, some uh, potential growth numbers from them as well. So it incorporates some of that as well. It's the, at least the reason. Yep. And, today's, and today's numbers were based on physical traffic counts of what's happening out there today. So we, we do try to base this in reality as best we can. So no build, I said I wouldn't spend much time on this, and I won't. So there is an option that if anyone thinks the right thing to do is no build, you can give feedback in the survey that no build is the right thing. But let's move on to the next. Um, so a paint only road diet, you know, what would this look like? So this is a plan view of the proposal. And overall, what, you know, one of the ways you use paint to narrow a roadway down is to put bike lanes in. And so we'd have bike lanes from Payne Turnpike, which is at the upper left of this image. Um, stretching all the way down to the to the central intersection 
Um, and then even having a bike lane pointing towards um, the Route 62 intersection, you wouldn't continue it all the way there because we need to maintain multiple lanes for that intersection as it is today. But you put shared roadway markings and make sure that people understand that they can take a bike not on Route 62, but across to Airport Road. Um, and then otherwise, and it's hard to see on this screen, but we'll go, we'll I'll dive into the intersection designs. There's a lot of spaces that are in the white hatching in the center of the area, as well as a median area on the, the southeast side of the um, central intersection that would be painted as hatched lines to again just sort of right size uh, the roadway as you come into this intersection and also make a lot more clarity for drivers, cyclists, or anyone else using the roadway um, about coming in. Sidewalks would be exactly as they are today. Street trees would be exactly as they are today because, again, this is sort of proposing it as what's a really low cost um, sort of solution that could be implemented quickly. Um, here's a zoom into the intersection of what, what we're looking at. And like I said, some of the biggest areas for sort of road diet, there's really a lot of extra room when you look at the Berlin Mall Road side of the roadway, um, as well as the receiving sort of lanes. Really, in right now, um, and I'll get to this in a slide in a moment, but there are three turn lanes, you know, a right, a through, and a left at either side of the intersection on Fisher Road. Um, and so you really only have, should have one receiving lane on the far end of that. Well, right now you've got, I think it's like 24 feet of asphalt there, which is easily two full lanes. And there occasionally are conflicts about cars kind of, kind of merging into that same space, somebody making a right out of the mall road, somebody coming through from Fisher. And it should be more clear that there's one lane there. So this paint really kind of clarifies those receiving lanes as one lane. I mean, it also takes those three lanes instead of left, uh, right, and through, it gets, it, it combines them. Um, and again, another piece about this is in an effort to use paint to make it a more bike safe uh, zone, is we put a bike box um, at this side of the intersection. And that does a few things. Um, the bike box design, the closest example we could find is Union and Pearl Street in Burlington, where they've implemented this. And these allow cyclists in areas where you try to promote promote use um, to get in front of, of automobiles at those turns. It reduces the right hook conflict where a cyclist will come up to the end of the bike lane and a car will come up to the same point, but maybe be a little ahead of them and not see them. And at a green light, cyclist goes straight. Car might have had its blinker on. The cyclist didn't notice. Car might not have its blinker on and go right anyways and sort of create this right hook conflict. Um, it's a way to make this, the intersection just a little bit more safe um, for the vulnerable road user. Um, so those are those are sort of the main pieces of it. Um, and here's a diagram too to show you what, you know, again, trying to reiterate what we were talking about about lane changes. Um, this and the next one where we say lane reduction, this is really the big move about lane reduction. Right now on the left, you've got your current design. And that is, again, a dedicated lane for each. But if you combine these, what that really frees up, you know, this frees up, you know, 11 to 15 feet of space in the roadway on either side that then can go to these expanded green spaces to sort of tightening up the road so it's more clear for drivers and anyone else using the road where to go. Um, and there are no proposed changes for the current configuration of lanes at CBMC and the hospital mall road. So that's the that's the change for sort of the four way. And you know, what's it all mean when we when we throw it into the computers and say, if we had all this traffic coming in here, what would it do? Um, I'll walk through these quickly, but basically we've got, when we compare it, existing conditions is this column on the left and the paint only road diet performance is on the right. And I think the, the subtle thing to take away here is that in a couple of years, the paint only road diet, even though you're taking a lane away, because that's reducing um, some disparity of turn movements, and because this, this paint only road diet, I, I failed to mention, also would include signal optimization. Um, our traffic modeler looked at the way the signals are timed currently and saw, based on volumes, ways that those timings could be improved to increase throughput. And so, based on that signal optimization and the changes, you know, right away, we could improve, we could improve the performance by 2025. And what you really see in, in a full build out scenario of this one is that it, doesn't make it doesn't make things not get worse in 2045, but it 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 solves it from being as bad as it would be if we don't do anything now. Just to, um, just to be clear too, this, so the way that this level of service thing works, A is the best, right? 
So about level of service, um, it's a mode used by traffic engineers to measure the performance of an intersection. And it's very much A, yes, is the best. And just like your grades at school, A, B, C, D, E. Unlike your grades at school, in urban contexts, and I'm not, I'm not going to say that Fisher Road yet is an urban context, but I think a new town center is aspiring to that. You don't want to walk through a city where all the intersections function at A, right? Anyone walking is going to go through a city where it's all functioning at A. Think maybe if anyone's been to downtown Houston um, in areas or just a very, very suburban area that's very auto dominated, really easy to drive, really scary to walk through those intersections. Those are A level intersections. Really in, in contexts like, like a Burlington, like a, like a Brattleboro, function, functioning at C or D is perfectly acceptable for urban areas. Um, and that's, you know, that's kind of the standard we go by. When you get to levels E or F, there are real problems there. And that's where the intersection is no longer letting people get through in a, an optimal time. Um, and so same thing for delays. You know, we really just see that um, the PM, the, the PM traffic load in this in this area is the, the, the hardest hit. Um, but in the four-way, you know, the, the takeaway here is that we can get it, we can get it no changes really at the paint turnpike, slightly better at the at the central intersection. Um, and at the at the at the mall road, there's a slight there's a slight decrease to at Route 62 in terms of queuing lanes going up, going up slightly. So that's that piece. Any questions about um, the first design, the paint only concepts? I'll pause at the end of these, take a couple minutes of questions, and if there's any more, we'll the uh, intersection three. delays. Yep. Um, that's the same scenario as above, right? Yeah, it's the the delay delay is, presented in seconds. One is one is delays, and the other one is level of service. Yeah, correct. I'm, correct. I'm surprised that as C has so much delays. Yep. Yeah, that's that's kind of the it's comparing to these delays are comparing from the baseline, like what it would be now, to you know in the in the morning, the intersection would perform maybe even slightly worse. But it'd be better in, in the evening compared to baseline, and that's kind of what you're seeing in these. But the but the worst uh, delay of 0.9 seconds is pretty marginal, um, so we're not too worried about that. What this what is is saying though is without a signal change, you've got significant delays now. Yep. Yep. Um, uh, AM and PM. Yeah, and an important thing the study will include is is some detail on those signal optimizations because the kind of neat thing about that is there's a change that can be made. You know, pretty quickly, no cost, no right. real infrastructure changes, just timing the lights. So, okay. Well, here again, let's go on to the next one. So this is this is formalizing that paint only design, right? Yep. Sorry. Question, Mike. Yeah, I had a question about the prior one. What yeah. you didn't look at was the signalization changes in the existing format and how that compares with the lane reduction and the signalization. Is that correct? Um, it's correct that I'm not presenting that here because I really wanted to present the baseline of what is out there today with what we're proposing as sort of a full suite of changes, but we will have that information in the report. And I think anybody that has more questions about traffic modeling, um, feel free to you know, drop an email in the chat if you're on Zoom or contact me directly if you're in the room and I can follow up with all the details there. I just need my, need my traffic modeling engineer to answer the questions more directly and this and right. I mean, with the improved timing make it, it is a benefit there's a benefit yeah. from and we and we have all those numbers studied as well just yeah. not presented as their own alternative okay anything else okay. cool okay thanks mike yeah thanks for the question so lane reduction and sidewalks so here's what you see taking that paint only um and then extending a system of sidewalks um all along the roadway and the main the main sort of new construction, you have existing sidewalk from C, B, and C um, down to the main crosswalk. But in this, in this scenario, you have an opportunity to um, add sidewalk all the way along the, the roadway, connecting all the way down to Payne Turnpike. You basically look at um, five-foot sidewalks along the whole of the corridor, some small additional space for street trees, and then maintaining a buffered bike lane. We didn't do a small, you know, smallest bike lane we could fit. We're thinking an eight-foot lane. Um, with with the opportunity for seasonal um, ballers to go in there when it's not snowing, um, and that's just going to you know ideally give a good corridor from Payne Turnpike all the way to sort of the entry to the new town center to CVMC, and then the bike lanes don't carry on um, as you go towards Route 62. 
Um, that just turns into a single lane, which widens out to multiple lanes at the Route 62 intersection. And again, that three to two lane here, this would also formalize a, um, a median in the middle of the, of the road. And so, you know, again, these are the pieces. The other, the other aspect to this is that sidewalk, we're uh, envisioning that this, any of these would dovetail with an ongoing project that they're looking at the shared use pathway as part of the new town center. And from, from this intersection forward, it would no longer be a narrow sidewalk, but it'd be a 12 foot shared use pathway that would connect with other destinations within the new town center. Uh, and that green space expansion, you know, the real vision for this side, I think, because your, your change in road configuration is really spent looking at adding sidewalks, adding bike lanes, and tightening up road profiles on the side between the central intersection and Payne Turnpike. Um, the entry from Route 62, we really envision as the sort of green entry because where we're using the space here is, is the existing trees and existing green space that front CVMC now would remain. There would be a sidewalk um, connecting two points of, of the campus. Um, but then that those three trees plus a uh, similar uh, rhythm of trees in a median and rhythm of street trees on the south, southern side of the street which sort of create this green entryway as you drive in, drive into the street. And then here's here's a diagram we just wanted to show. Can I ask you real quick? Oh yes. So what is the advantage of having the median in the middle? Having the median. Uh, a couple. So this is actually good 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 timing for that question. I I think it's good timing because I can see this. I'm not sure if everyone can. But the couple a couple advantages to this is shortening pedestrian distances. You know when you're talking about connecting a hospital with goods and services. Um, there's opportunities here to uh, make this just a refuge place. If you if you're moving slower, if you're using a walker to get across the the walk, that's one of the main advantages of the median is, is having that pedestrian safe zone in the middle. Um, the other the other advantage of of having it really is a traffic calming. It's in in general what a lot of the studies show is that not necessarily that medians directly will calm traffic, but street trees are shown to calm traffic. Median gives you a place to put them. And they also have a lot of studies showing that as roadways get narrower, um, people will slow to their cars down a little bit more. So it's a little bit of a traffic calming effect because one thing we don't want to do in these designs, we want to make sure people can drive their, we're in Vermont, people need to drive their cars. Um, we want to make sure people can get where they're going, but when you're arriving at Newtown Center, we don't want to treat it like a highway. We don't want that level of service A, it's just easy driving fast. We want this to start to feel more like a Newtown Center and sort of slowing down and reaching that. So kind of those are the, the intentions with that. Um, and what this graphic on the screen is showing here is that it has relatively few impacts over what's built today. I mean, the way road redesign works, if you rebuilt these, there'd be a lot of construction way outside these red lines. You know, everywhere you have new sidewalk or new, um, a new median would be construction. But in the end, analysis of what's built today compared to what's proposed is that it's only these really red stripes that would be where there'd be any additional um, impact, which is really important when you consider 802 Toyota over here and how close their um, their work is to the edge of right of way and edge of pavement. So it's all pretty compact um, impacts over here. And then again, looking again at these um, these impacts, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here because this is exactly what we looked at on the prior one. In terms of traffic modeling, again, this is formalization of what the paint does. So there's no real big changes. It, overall, same same effect from 2025 to 2045 at Payne Turnpike, slightly better performance at the central intersection with these changes, and um, slightly longer queue lengths at the at the round at the Route 62 intersection. Any any questions on that particular section before we get to the next one? Anyone on Zoom? Okay, and we'll we have the opportunity to ask more questions later too. Okay. So roundabout and pathway. Um, big thing. So I'll walk through kind of a lot of these changes here. Um, but you know, this is an opportunity for placemaking, and it's an opportunity for improved traffic management because the big thing about the roundabout design and why it was proposed here is looking at sort of the this has a reasonably balanced uh, series of turning movements in the area. They're not all one direction coming out of CVMC or anywhere else. There's kind of a general distribution. And there's a lot of benefits to the way a roundabout could perform uh, considering these future traffic loads. So for bicycle and pedestrian improvements, the big thing here 
is that pathway that we referenced in, because that pathway is in the Newtown Center Plan, that's really why it was included in that four-way alternative. And then here, you'll notice there's no bike lanes anywhere on the street. This is a separated facility. Um, it's off the roadway by about a 10-foot green strip in most places. That, that buffer narrows significantly as you go down into the narrower part of the roadway. But there is enough room to carry that pathway all the way through to Payne Turnpike. Um, and that sort of two-way facility focuses that pedestrian and bicycle movement off the roadway um, in a shared 12-foot wide pathway space. We did get a fair bit of feedback in our first public survey that we had to do a very contiguous thing in the shared use path. Yeah. And, there's, and then there's minor sidewalk expansions in this that would link up basically where you have existing sidewalk, bringing it into other entrances to the CVMC campus, both to the north and to the south. Um, and those are the major improvements. The other thing, again, about the benefits of a roundabout, um, from a, you know, I'm a cyclist who rides as fast as I possibly can standpoint, roundabouts can sometimes be um, a drawback because they have to kind of go around and slow down at, through these crossings. But for most of us, or really the people I think we're trying to design for, which is all ages and abilities um, and all comfort levels, roundabouts have a lot of benefits for these crossings because if you don't mind the slight detour from this point over to this, your crossing distances are significantly lower, right? Instead of crossing, you know, now in the previous design, there's three lanes of traffic. You're really only crossing two and you still have a small um, median island in that to come through. And then green space expansion too, because this really narrows down. Now this is cropped so that you don't see how in the, in the design, um, moving towards Route 62, that two lanes will slowly taper out to the full configuration where it is today um, in order to allow queuing and to allow more cars to move in that direction. But for the most of uh, Fisher Road, this is a two lane roadway and you have a lot more room for street trees and not just street trees, but really healthy street trees. Um, where there's existing street trees um, in front of the CVMC campus, they would all remain. A sidewalk would go, um, I guess, towards the roadside of there, and we could install another row and just really make this green space all along the streetscape, which I think ahead of any redevelopment of these parking lots is a really wonderful way to buffer the um, sort of visual impact of all these parking lots, create higher land values all across um, this corridor, and really create a nice, a nice place to be. Um, that's the green space expansion piece I want to talk about. And here's that a similar diagram just with the roundabout superimposed on the aerial today and where you see the impacts. We looked at where to place this and, and how to shift it. There's no way to put a roundabout within the existing configuration of, of um, the roadway and avoid impact, but this can stay largely within the right of way. And overall, the largest impact is to the undeveloped land that's really south of that intersection. Um, so that's, that's what we're anticipating there. And then traffic analysis, there's a reason you see a lot of modern roundabouts being constructed today. I mean, if you go out west in Colorado, they're roundabout crazy. You go around, I think, I think Burlington's building one on Shelburne Street right now. It's really because as we deal with more people coming into our communities, as we deal with more people moving through them, they move traffic well. Like you don't have to stop and wait behind a car who waits behind a car who waits behind a car. And so the, the main thing we saw here is that throughout, throughout the corridor, you're getting better performance at that central intersection by a site. And that's including, you know, if we leave things today, we have level of performance E at this central intersection. If we put a roundabout in, it, up, it ups to A. Um, and that's with all the Newtown Center traffic added in. Um, so we see a lot less delays on it, a lot better movement at that intersection. We even see um, slight improvements over at the Payne Turnpike intersection. And this is sort of represented in these um, maximum queue lengths at the bottom. Um, and, then, and then the big challenge is what's the impact here? And we've seen basically in our models, we're not showing significant negative impacts at the Route 62 intersection. But one thing we want to make sure we're doing our due diligence on the study is understanding if more traffic is able to move towards that intersection more quickly, um, what's that impact to queue lengths and how many more cars are stacking up at a light um, at Route 62. So any significant change like this would absolutely need to be designed in conjunction with VTRANS to ensure that those, the signal timing and everything else at the Route 62 intersection maintains. But like we're seeing in total queue length, 2045, 13, if we don't change anything, 13 cars stack up at like the worst time of afternoon traffic. And with the roundabout, we're seeing the same number. So yeah. it you know goes up a little bit, but not not much. 
So for uh, Jim and Eileen, since we talked about this on Friday, we did did do some more modeling to look at this, and ultimately, although initially our first path had some numbers that had us concerned, once we reran it several times, the numbers were became much more uh, into a, what we considered a, a very reasonable amount. And I do think, though, that just like Dayton said, there's opportunities for us to talk to VTrans about what, how could the signal be timed differently? You know, I mean, their, the current intersection at 62 is not designed with a roundabout. It, 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 it's not configured to receive traffic from a roundabout. So they may be able to go, okay, if there's a roundabout there, how would we change the signal timing and how would, how could we improve that? Or just, is there something they could do to reconfigure it? They can help me here. I mean, earlier on, I think this slide is somewhat in conflict with what you said earlier, uh, that in urban areas, you don't want an A, A, A. And now we have A, A, A. So help me here. That's fair. Um, I think that's my my course description to say that a focus on A performance at all expenses is problematic when we say like we need we need A performance at all times. The roundabout design, I think if you have A performance, but traffic's moving very slowly, you're fine. There's a lot of people are moving through very slowly. And so I think it's, I think I should definitely couch what I said earlier in that it's not an A level of service that's poor, it's when A level of service is coupled with high speeds, right? right. And saying we're gonna, we're gonna move. And, and where the through. pedestrian infrastructure isn't built in a way that sort of offsets that, right? Thank you. Yeah. Absolutely. But yeah, A level of service is a good thing. It can move a lot of vehicles. I have a question. Yes, sir. Um, I assume the traffic modeling is also projecting some growth at the Central Mountain Medical Center. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we don't have we don't have numbers from their like most recent plan, but we talked when I talked to those folks, um, the numbers we have that we had from the last work we've done with them, they were like, yeah, that's pretty close. So uh, they felt felt comfortable. I do think that the numbers will probably be useful for my guests and speak for this. Is it might be high, a little higher than what that what we have, but um, I think it's pretty close. So, yeah, I think uh, we really had I'm conscious that, that they've had plans to make uh, significant increases in, sure. in the amount of traffic that goes there. Yep. And this can't ignore that. Agreed. Well, yeah, and for that reason, I think in any of these, we're not proposing changing or closing any access configurations. I mean, we'll there's multiple places that, that we narrow the driveways to, to right size them to allow you know two vehicle two two vehicles to pass in and out. Um, but we don't remove any, we don't narrow them down beyond that. So, yeah. I'm sorry, you go ahead. Well, um, I, another question, I, I, the configuration of the roundabout, mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't able to see exactly what you did, but it looks to me like you moved the roundabout south. Correct, yeah, I mean, from the pure center of where we have it today, we did, we did move it, slightly south and I think that was looking at where where can we impact the least because I think if it moves up here we get into street tree impacts um, we get into uh, some concerns about some of the roadway up up uh, I guess northwest of here um, so yeah we were kind of looking at these zones as maybe the most uh, expendable perhaps but that can always be adjusted you know so that addresses the grades and Going into the thing. it does it. That's the thing. Is so the, you're concerned about the grades, uh, Bob. That that you're slightly lower as you're leaving the CVMC campus than the center of the roadway. You would undoubtedly have to, you know, get a few feet of fill coming in here. So again, this doesn't represent the only spaces that would be constructed, right? I mean, this whole thing would be reconstructed. But the moving it this way allows you to sort of establish a better grade so that traffic <laughs> queuing up here, uh, particularly, you know, the incoming direction. Can see where they can see what they're getting into. Yes. Um, I, on your diagram for the roundabout, I was having um, a difficulty understanding the pedestrian and the cyclist lanes. So, and uh -huh. are, are they more safe in something in the roundabout as opposed to the other one? Yeah, absolutely. So, I would tell you this. You know, I've got a six-year-old who's learned to bike, ride his bicycle, and is you know, I'll ride him through downtown Montpelier, you know, kind of, kind of cautiously to his school. Um, but I'd be much more comfortable in the roundabout with him than in the four-way. If you know, was riding through both. So of them. they're basically nowhere near the roundabout, like. A, the, yeah. Example. So let me walk you through that here. Uh, I think the 3D might be a little bit better um, of a vision for this. So, 
So the pathway, if, if you were say, uh, if you were, you know, leaving our meeting, this was built today and we're leaving the meeting hall, we're meeting right there, right there, there's us. You would, you would cross the street here at Payne Turnpike and hop on a pathway and walking or biking, if you're coming down Fisher Road, you'd come all the way through here. If you were visiting Vermont Psychiatric, we'd be maintaining the existing crosswalk to that bus station and you'd be on this pathway walking or biking up, up here. Now from the intersection, say you need to go to the door of CVM, the major door of CVMC that's about where I'm standing. I'm standing on the building right now. So you would, you would pick, pick your direction, but you'd either cross you know, the Fisher Road leg and then walk around a sidewalk over here and then cross the CVMC road leg and then walk to your destination at CVMC, or you'd come up towards the, towards the mall, cross this leg, walk around, Come in that, that direction. Does that does that yeah. help? Yeah. Sorry, anybody on Zoom. I'm doing a lot of that 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 with my finger, That's but great. hopefully you can follow the pathway around the intersection in the blue. Are there any controls associated with those crosswalks? Um, typically, typically not. Typically, it is a um, there's they can have RRFBs in them, and we haven't gone so far as to identify what what controls are um, RFBs. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Acronym alert. Alphabet soup. Um, you see these in downtown Montpelier when you drive through, but these are they're the pedestrian signal that has, uh, I gotta say, RRFB, rectangular rapid flashing beacon. Um, and that's that's what those are. Good way to signal the drivers, pedestrians are crossing the roadway. Um, you could have signal activates, activations for those. You've also, I've also got many examples of these across the United States where they're built with good sight lines and it's you know a yield to pedestrian sign. And that's that's what. That's what it is. But the crossing distances on these are much shorter and a much more comfortable space to walk walk through. So and include a, a landing area midpoint. Mm -hmm. so Each there, of these have that landing area in them, and to, so that's that median that creates a divider between the two lanes, narrows the roadway down, and slows those speeds down as they approach the roundabout. So the last thing you want is people getting into a roundabout fast. So if Aaron has a question, Darren, if you want to unmute and ask, go ahead. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I know that this is primarily about this particular intersection. I'm curious how the bike and pedestrian path interfaces as we approach Payne Turnpike and Route 62 and, and what happens to it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great question. Um, so not illustrated here, but, but as you, the pathway would not reach or cross uh, Route 62 as it's designed. This would loop sort of round internally to the, the new town center. And I think we want to make recommendations in this study for VTrans to consider that connectivity across Route 62 at this point. You know, you've got a good precedent, even though it's not particularly lovely pedestrian crossing. If you go, you know, Route 62 towards the interstate um, on ramp, there is a pedestrian crossing there as Payne Turnpike hits the road. Um, so we make recommendations for that. But as this design is cons considered, that that pathway is sort of self-contained at that end. And then as you as you reach um, as you reach Payne Turnpike, we, we're envisioning that there would be, you know, the pathway would hit the edge of Payne Turnpike and have access from the road onto this pathway um, for people walking and people on bikes to get onto it there. And that would basically be the, the entry point. Okay. And, and then um, <clears throat> just over like where the, where the Subaru or 802 Toyota or, or whichever um, car dealership that is, um, where that comes out in the park from the parking lot further towards Payne Turnpike, does the bike path continue through there to? Um, do, do you see where I mean? I'm looking at this um, this current drawing. slide. Yeah. So if you're looking at the drawing, there's is that, it does go all the way through the roadway, right? So the pathway is envisioned along okay. the, between this proposed roundabout intersection and mm -hmm. Payne Turnpike. You'd have other than breaks in for. Um, for access points to the the National Guard point there, the to the 802. Um, other it than just those, picks up on the other side of the driveway. Yeah, you go across the oh, driveway. Okay. Great. Yep. Yep. And those driveways. Thanks. Mark yep. Thank you. There. Yeah, well, there'd be a reconfiguration of how those driveways work to really identify that pathway and have it be a, a, a consistent corridor across. No. Any yes, other sir? any other questions? Here. That does it. Thanks. Thanks, Darren. Uh, um, even with the, the, the discussion, um, we talked about this at the town meeting the other day. 
uh, using that Stuart Road right here, Stuart, yeah. Stuart Road as a connector kind of to the rest of uh, the the recreation facilities and, and the in the community like Berlin Pond and everything. Mm -hmm. um, I'm still not terribly confident that there's a very good crossing to Stewart Road from mm -hmm. here. Yeah. Okay. It's going to be our connector to, to town from the town center. Yeah, we should probably put some more thought into that. Into that into that intersection. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's a minimal minimal as currently sketched out, but that's yeah. like we're in. So everyone, like I said earlier, we're in this phase of saying, here's three designs mm -hmm. and comments like that are great to kind of get into the record because I think we can, as process of getting to this is the preferred design, mm -hmm. take a second look at that and say, what's the most we can do to make that steward to Fisher a good, a good connection? Yeah, it doesn't so, seem like it'd be a whole heck of a lot. It just right. needs something. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Nate, just for your uh, uh, for context here, when we, when the town of Berlin applied for this project mm -hmm. and the, and this multiple, multiple use path there's uh the mall uh, excuse me the the hospital has a current recreation path down there and and with the the, the multi-use path in the in the town center we wanted to connect that to our assets over in berlin corners you know the the berlin pond and and our initial vision was of six, route 62 crossing yeah. But in, in retrospect, in, uh, in, in <laughs> retrospect, uh, uh, we were thinking that that uh, because that's going to take time, money, and effort. That yeah. one, that uh, as as Jeff was saying, you would cross with Fisher Road. You'd cross Pain Turnpike onto Stewart Road, yep. And, yep. and it's and that's a traditional Vermont gravel oh, road, road, right? Yep. And, and with 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 maybe bike uh, stations along the way. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so the okay. record, no thanks thanks for those mentions I think that is a lot of reason as we develop this to really look at what that what that linkage looks like because that's that's absolutely well within well within the scope of this project and just on the uh, recreation committee yep. uh, and the in the planning mission are jointly just starting those discussions Good. now okay great Good to know. Yes, yeah if I could just add to that too quickly the um I mean, we live on up on Hill Street Extension, and we've been up there uh, 15 years or so now. And we are seeing now within the last, first of all, gravel riding. I'm a big cyclist, and gravel riding is taking off all over the state, all over the country, all over the world, really. And we're seeing more and more bikes all the time going by our house. I mean, groups of four, five people loaded up bike packing. Yeah, so yeah, I think, you guys, I think you guys are on the Super 8 route. But but That's yeah, true. but I mean, but so so having connectivity to this space from Stewart Road or people that oh I need to go get something I right. forgot whatever I need I got to go to the mall to buy something for my trip or whatever to be able to just ride in from Stewart Road it would be yeah. really fantastic you know. <clears throat> cool. All right, uh, Nate, you well, that gets me down to that the second to last slide here too is that. What we're really looking for, and thank you for all these comments, you know, this, this is all the stuff we need to really be able to take the study to a revised um, approach, is that we're looking at saying, okay, we've, pre we've, we've presented, you know, I'm going to say four here because we always include no bill, but, you know, um, we have we have these options, how do they perform? And this is real conceptual, like I, I, made, I made up these scores really briefly, but saying, you know, in traffic performance, you know, no builds, eh. Paint only road diet will get better. Lane reduction and sidewalks will get better. Roundabout and pathway, I should actually be an A, is, is doing great, right? And bike ped safety, you know, it's terrible today. We could do a little better. We could do even better than that. And we could have a whole shared use pathway to be great, right? For complexity, hey, today's great for complexity. You don't have to do anything, but no reward there either. Um, you know, and so how's that fair in complexity? And the thing we don't have filled out really yet as part of this process, other than the initial meetings on the topic, is you know what is what is people's reaction to this? What is sort of the public and stakeholder support? You know, when we're having lots of conversations with business owners along Fisher Road, if that's a really important group to target. But everyone here listening to this this meeting, y'all are important. Text your friends, everybody who you know that uses the area, whether you live in Berlin or just passing through. We'd like to hear from you. We'd like to hear kind of what you what you think of these. And so, this information is all going to be up on the. I think it is now up on the project website. Um, and we have this is a QR code to the the survey. It's a real simple. Hey, thanks for listening to this presentation. 
And if you haven't listened to this presentation, here's a link to it. Um, take a look at the presentation. Tell us what you think is best for the future of Fisher Road, why. And we're going to be going back to our desks, sharpening our pencils, and really refining this um, to, to try to get it right um, as part of this effort. And so um, this survey is open for the next month. We, you know, and I think I'm really encouraging everybody here that's here on Zoom, that's here in person, you know, casually talk to your friends about this, send them a text being like, hey, you know, you work on Fisher Road or you pass through here all the time, you, you're my neighbor. Take a look at this because that word of mouth is one of the best ways to drive input from these studies. And I think we can come up with a good design. We don't hear a lot, but our design will be that much better if we really build it off of what the community is saying. So um, definitely love to hear, hear a lot of responses on this. And that's, that's more or less all I've got for my pedantic presentation. I hope it was reasonable. Folks on Zoom, I just dropped a link to the survey into the chat. Dayton, what, when do you uh, start showing costs? The cost on this, um, you know, and we can really, we can really kind of go back to this and apply order of magnitude cost, pre for no build, um, paint only road diet, let's give that, you know, $2 signs, $4 signs for lane reduction and sidewalk and $6 signs for roundabout and pathway, right? And, and I know that's not showing costs like we were asking about. We'll be getting into that, um, I think, as we get to a preferred alternative and we kind of hear. We run the heavy duty numbers on, on the preferred alternative. Yeah, and we'll have, we'll have a full cost estimate for that. But I, I there's a couple of revisions in here. I noticed a couple of slip ups in the way the some of my, um, not the numbers we're presenting, but the graphics <coughs> slipped in there and a couple of them. So I'm going to have an update to this. Um, and one thing I'll do with, with that update is it won't be exact dollars and cents, but we can add like an order of magnitude cost to this comparison chart on this page, because I think that's an important thing when people are reviewing it and saying, I like this one best, to recognize that we may all want a roundabout and pathway, but that, that will be the most expensive option. So that's kind of our, that's the cost answer at this point. I just, I just thought of a, maybe it's a question or more of a statement, but yeah. it's my understanding that as part of some of the new federal highway and some of the new priorities coming down from the feds in terms of project building that bike pedestrian uh, projects are of higher priority than let's say they have been in the past. And so perhaps there may be there may be federal dollars available for a project. Yeah, guaranteed. Um, there there are there are federal dollars. There's always been good federal dollars available. Um, it's always, you know, the interesting thing is when you talk about multi-million dollar projects, feds will cover 80% and the town covers another 20. Which, when you're talking, was multi million dollars, twenty percent heads up real fast yeah, right. town. So, so it's there. Um, there's, it's, it is interesting. I mean, there's the new Safe Streets for All initiative that is a brand new funding source specifically for, um, you know, bike pad and place making initiatives. Um, there's some really fascinating stuff about tearing down freeways, which is not what we're dealing with here, but. Um, the Route 62 big dig to put it all underground. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Twelve dollars on it. <laughs> so. Yeah, they're there, and that's definitely something. As any of these scoping studies, our implementation chapter in this final report will finish with you know, kind of a complete recognition of like here's the resources we can kind of look to mining going forward. And I I think it's fair to say whatever the, the vision that the town decides on is that it, it's not all going to be done at at one time, right? Absolutely. It's, it's right. going to be done in pieces. Right. You do the engineering design first, yeah. you know, and you know come up with those dollars and then you look at these other and so it, it may take you know a good five ten years before you yep. get a lot of this done however without doing this and having the vision it'll never get done i mean that's a guarantee exactly and i think and i think in tom i think y'all on that side of the table can can speak to this better than i can because you're involved in day to day <laughs> but i see kind of the final product of this being a community driven design that really sets the, the, the vision for the future of the mm -hmm. road where that's really going to come in handy is ideally this new town center effort really takes off and there's some new development in the town center and then all of a sudden someone's saying you know that, that old armory i'm going to buy that i'm going to put up these houses and then they say great we know exactly what needs to go in the frontage there you know because we have a scoping study for this and it sort of guides the development mm -hmm. in the corridor as well There we go. Anyone uh, on Zoom have any questions, comments? Here it is. 
Well, thank you all for your time. Um, please uh, don't hesitate to take the survey if you haven't already. Um, the, the link to the survey is on the website. We will update the um, the slides are on there right now, but we'll we update probably update tomorrow. them tomorrow just to uh, give them a little more um, detail. And um, those will be up there. And then the survey closes on November twenty fifth. Um, so spread the word if you can. And um, thank you everybody for your time. Well, Chris and Dane, just thank you for the professionalism of this presentation. Okay. Our pleasure. Good opportunity. I can't wait. I can't wait to see the future of Fisher Running. It's down the road. Well, my kid probably won't be sick, so I won't that way. <laughs> Jim, do you think you're unmuted? Do you have a question well, or something? I'm just going to say thank you and, um, you know, good night. Sounds like we're down. So appreciate the presentation and, and the invite. Thanks, Thanks Jim. Coming. Appreciate it. Sure. Reach out to me if you have any other questions. Okay, thank you.